Welcome to our signature series, Leading in Extraordinary Times or XO series. Now on its third year, the series was designed to highlight the experiences and practices of global and Philippine CEOs. The aim is to help inspire and enable businesses around the country to accelerate job creation and economic growth. Thank you to our secondary sponsors, Huawei Philippines and Health Now, and to our media partners, ANC and Business World. Before we formally begin, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our board members, Mr. Victor Paterno, who is with us today on site, and Ambassador Jose Quisha, who is joining via Microsoft Teams. We also have our members and guests who are joining us virtually via Microsoft Teams. May I request you to open your cameras to say hi to everyone? National Executive Director Coco. Please don't forget to have your first and last name with your company in your display name so that we can identify you accordingly later. If you need help in doing that, one of my colleagues can assist you. Now to open today's session, I would like to call on our trustee, Victor Paterno, to introduce our speaker today. Hi, good morning all. Uh, thank you for making it both physically and virtually. Uh, in this year's XO series, we have an amazing lineup of CEO speakers uh, from local and global companies including uh, Dennis Anthony Uy of Converge ICT in July, uh, Lita Tayag of Accenture uh, in August, and uh, Ernesto Tanmanjong of Jollibee in September. Peter Mac, finally, Peter uh, Maquera of uh, Microsoft in October. I think Peter's here. Uh, today, we're kicking off the series with uh, Manny Maceda, worldwide managing partner of Bain & Company. Uh, Manny joined Bain over 30 years ago and took the job in top job in 2018. He has become one of the foremost experts on large scale transformations, digital transformations, ESG leadership, and business role in society. Manny is in Manila to open Bain's Manila office, signaling confidence in our country's future. It's his third time to speak to MBC in 2019. He presented to MBC how CEOs can lead their company's transformational journey in the era of disruption. In 2020, he was one of the first we turned to for insight on managing through the pandemic. And uh, we're grateful for the chance to hear from Manny again today. We may have come out of the pandemic, sort of, um, uh, but we're faced with war, inflation, uneven growth, volatile markets, numerous employees making work-life balance decisions, and technology able to do more and more work at the same time, uh, hopefully without taking our jobs away. Um, all of this, some of this we discussed this morning at uh, breakfast, a uh, smaller group, um, uh, including how MBC uh, can play a more active role um, in this very uncertain environment. Uh, Manny, thank you for joining us today, despite your very busy schedule. We're excited to hear your insights. Uh, may I invite you on stage for your remarks. Thank you for my kind introduction, Victor. Thank you for the uh, Makati Business Club for being patient to invite me back. Um, I haven't uh, overstayed my welcome. It's it's almost impossible that the first time I spoke here, it was all in person. The second time it was all virtual. And now it's hybrid, which is maybe a sign of the, the times that we're in. And I'd like to thank uh, the, uh, also all the trustees of the MBC, including uh, those, who are, uh, those who are online. Um, you know, the, uh, I think it's a great uh, organization that you have that's trying to make a difference in the country and influence um, how, how businesses in particular can make a difference. We can comment on that later. And the topic here, uh, leading at extraordinary times, and, and maybe I'll comment uh, how I titled it, global uncertainty. 
Um, I've had the privilege now of leading a global firm that operates in 40 countries, 65 offices. And I'm watching um, all of our clients, which include corporates, NGOs, investors. And, uh, and I've been with the firm, as uh, Victor said, uh, over 30 years. I would say for many management teams that have lived through periods of uncertainty, global financial crisis, downturns, Y2K, et cetera, you name it. General views, this is the most uncertain times we, we've seen, we have. And so how we navigate this, and it's global, because while we all would like to operate within the boundaries of our own company or our own countries, uh, we've been living in a world where um, all the supply chains, all the financing, all the customers are somewhat interconnected globally. And the reason it's uncertain is, you know, is that likely to change? So maybe I'd just like to uh, comment a little bit on where we started. Even before this year, if you look at uh, the last talk, the first talk I gave, we were probably five years as a global economy into what you might broadly call digital transformation, technology in all its forms. That's continuing. About three years ago, the world really started putting um, energy behind the transformation in Davos, January 2020 was all ESG all the time, decarbonization. So that continues. And, and then at the time in Davos, where they were said, oh, there's this virus coming out of Wuhan. What might that be? Over a few months, we all know that we had COVID. And, and the world responded um, to successfully, more successfully than others to different degrees by country. And so as we were starting this year, Actually, you could argue things were looking quite good. We had learned as companies and societies to operate in a hybrid world. We're still doing it today. Economies had rebounded. Uh, markets were up. Again, this varies a little bit country by country. We had another surge, you know, called Omicron. Um, we had supply chain shortages around the world, partly created by COVID. Um, and but we were reasonably optimistic in fact if you were to ask many companies um, what's our number one challenge at the time it was labor we need more people to fill jobs you know we need to work and uh, and then in february russia invaded ukraine and so that has created another series of of shocks to the system, which is why we have this un uncertainty. Um, uh, many companies, us included, literally within days or weeks chose to pull out of Russia, you know, a big market. We all know the implications on the energy supply, on food supply. So inflation has reared its head. Um, we've had many management teams around the world unless you were in some countries like Argentina, perhaps, that have not lived through a meaningful high inflation environment. And often with inflation comes rising interest rates, as has already started. And so we've had a lot of management teams not live through high interest rates environments. We had an overabundance of capital for the last many years. So as we're sitting here in the middle of 2022, back to the title, it really is global uncertainty. Um, people ask pretty fundamental questions. Will there be a recession? Simple answer, of course there's going to be a recession. Economies don't only go in one direction. The only question is when, and the question is how deep and how short. You know? and, uh, and so how do we plan? How do we act as individual companies? So that's a little bit what I'd like to cover. Um, I would say uh, to get somewhat, that, by the way, I wanted to show on this picture, you know, I, I'm, I, I live in San Francisco, that uh, price, that pricing is uh, several months old. The, the highest one is near $8 on, uh, on V-Power in, uh, in the Bay Area. So, um, and, and obviously that has implications for us. Let me see if I can get this to move. 
Although we, we probably don't need slides, so I'm happy to keep going if you, if you don't want. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment on inflation. What are some of the implications for inflation? Obviously, risks on compressing your margins, risks on cash flow, risks on top line. And so regardless of the scenarios that we are playing for, um, putting the muscles to work, and we've seen this with many of our clients, cost muscles, pricing muscles, cash flow muscles. But uh, if I move from the tactical, we all have to deal with inflationary interest rate environments to the uh, more strategic. What are a couple of reflections? Um, there is not uh, a new normal anymore. You know, some people ask, can we get over this tapos na ang COVID and go back to a steady state? Uh, we don't believe there is going to be a new normal, and so we should anticipate continued turbulence. Um, in the World Economic Forum, we had a big debate there. Was, was COVID-19 a black swan? Or should we just, from a planning standpoint, expect pandemics to come at some pace? Was Russia invading Ukraine a black swan? Or should we expect meaningful global uncertainty and action, including closer to home here. So if you say there is no new normal, to meet the challenge, you sort of have to do three things somewhat better. We would say number one is prediction without expecting that you can actually have a crystal ball. But some, if you spend time, we can debate this. Could we have anticipated? As Bill Gates would have said years ago, that something like COVID might show up. Could we have anticipated that Russia would invade Ukraine and a big chunk of the world's energy and food supply would come offline? Having skills on prediction and scenario planning matters. Second is if I go to the, uh, to the lower uh, left, you have to be adaptable because you're not ever going to be able to predict perfectly. And then third, because of even when you're adapting and changing your strategies all the time, you have to have some resilience. Um, the days of saying, I'll, I'll put a project in, I'll have predictable returns, we are one year, two year, three year, four year, five. So, you know, one reflection is don't hope that it will come back to a new stable normal just roll with the punches, deal with it, be a more flexible company to the extent you can, increase your sensing skills, be more adaptable, be more resilient. Because there's also opportunities. Some of you remember the second quarter of 2020 when we thought everything would um, just, you know, really go down, downward, downward, downward. The companies that made bets in that period are the ones who succeeded in capturing the upswing. And so we would say now, uh, I still see these questions, oh, will the recession come? Will things slow down? You know, now is the time to make, to take some of the actions, to make, to have the proper debates and to engage your entire management team, you know, not just uh, CEO, CXOs, boards, etc. So I'll share that with, uh, with a few reflections. Now, if I say, um, what are some of the shifts that allow you to think about predictions, scenario planning for the future? Here's a few. Some of these will matter in more industries than others. Um, what are the customers of the future versus the customers of today? How much will technology and data continue to advance? How much will your operations reconfigure based on things like deglobalizing? How will the business boundaries involve, evolve? Do you work with your competitors more? Um, the macro transformations that we've talked about and societal and sustainability. ESG is not just about sustainability of the energy that we consume and the resources of the planet. It's a sustainability of the societies we live in to have some stability. The, uh, the continued um, 
split in wealth between the top and the bottom and the implications of what happens in the next few years, maybe the next few months, as big chunks of the world might enter famine because of the disconnection of the food supply. Think about how that will create um, social strife. It's been many, many years since World War II. Are those all suddenly part in our scenarios? You know, we, we live through World War II in this country. So part of, uh, part of uh, I don't mean this to be doom and gloom, I'm just saying be prepared uh, for many different scenarios, but spend some time predictability. Let's talk about some of the secular trends that you're familiar with, and maybe I'll comment on this and what, what the themes might be for your companies. Uh, geopolitical post-globalization, what does that mean? Well, for the last 20 years, perhaps, we can debate the time, we have been all trying to work in a global world including Philippines, right? the world's call center, capital, um, financial flows can cross boundaries, talent flows can cross boundaries, customers cross boundaries. What's happening now, post-globalization, is there is some retreat back to national boundaries in different ways. Uh, the events in Russia and Ukraine made that real fast. But it had been happening long before that. Many of our American clients, starting with the, uh, the Trump administration, who took a very adversarial approach to China with tariffs, uh, even then started trying to rebalance and disconnect their supply chains. By the way, all of these creates opportunities potentially for countries like us. Um, capital rationalization. We have had an abundance of capital in, uh, in this world, public and private, for the last few years. Will that reduce, um, especially in an interest rate environment? Labor tightness. You've all been reading, in fact, this came up this morning, the great resignation. What did that mean is when companies rebounded, economies rebounded in the second half of 2020 and 2021, to our surprise, we couldn't find enough workers to fill jobs. That was at all levels, basic jobs, more sustained jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, spatial dispersion as, as we um, repopulate all around and, and locate in different places, both our intellectual property and our, and our physical presence. So you'll see a lot of themes that are potentially solves for that. Um, supply chain repatriation, what does it mean? Moving key parts of your supply chain back on shore or away from places that the last two years showed you should not have put all your eggs in one basket, either because of COVID or war. Service sector automation. Um, this was a theme I talked about two years ago, right? Um, Call centers was BPO was one of the ultimate service sectors in the uh, in the long run. If you couldn't find enough BPO workers, could you automate the same way you did manufacturing? Um, the definition of state and societies, getting governments back involved, uh, ex-urban uh, migration. This is going back and forth two ways, and you see this how COVID. Um, in some cases, has hollowed out cities. And, uh, and then maybe, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is a consequent theme that, that's relevant here, space exploration. You know, it used to be, uh, um, I, I like to tell sort of Google used to have uh, uh, an allocation methodology for the investments that roughly was 70% um, invest in the core business, 20% on related adjacent businesses so that you can build new engines and five or 10% take moonshots. Literally some random thing that may come. And, you know, Elon and some others took the moonshot idea seriously, although they're going for Mars in some cases. And, and so, you know, and maybe in the long run, that's part of the solution. So what, what are we saying? Lots of trends, lots of uncertainty, 
how do you deal with this as leaders, as companies that are going through um, this period? Is, is it the same old strategic planning process? Is it the same old, you know, get some help from management consultants to help? You know, we, would, we would never say that. Um, you, you just have to have an approach that's got to be more robust in developing what we would call uh, scenarios and perhaps signposts. Um, scenarios, so you, we could all debate what scenarios. So what, what, are, what are some of the steps in an in a updated approach to strategic planning in this time of uncertainty? What's the impact of the trends on our business? It's not even my business. What is the impact of the trend on the profit pool of my industry? Because I'm only going to take a chunk of that pool. Can you construct, can you have enough predictability to plan for the future? I asked for this myself, by the way, I'll admit that um, management consultants apply, do strategic planning for ourselves also, because we're also a business, we're also a company. And I'm constantly thinking as a line leader, as opposed to a consultant, what are the scenarios for the management consulting industry? You know, in the end, if I look at technology, will you have a virtual advanced analytics, you know, Trisha, that's just a software download. And I've, we've demoed some of this app. Trisha, what's the future strategy for my company versus having to, uh, um, you know, en engage in a proper team. So can you construct and evaluate end state scenarios for the industry? And what are the signposts that you can say along the way that means it's going to go to scenario A versus scenario B? What are the no regret moves? Because even when there's uncertainty, there's some things you can say, you know, in all scenarios, no matter what happens between the US and China, we can make this investment and it's, it's a no regret. Um, what's the competitive reaction? because uh, you're also, it's the competitor going to anticipate your scenario better than you. And that takes down to your major choice points, your major investments, what are the big bets? And then create a strategy in the playbook. So that's, that's where it gets a little bit, you know, more consistent. And um, so I, I would say, um, as we wrap, it's, it's not about, uh, perfect anticipation because part of the theme is it's too hard in this period of uncertainty to say I will predict what 2023 or 2025 will look like. Um, it's an integrated, adaptable, flexible strategy. It's signposts that you'll monitor. And then when the, when the trigger gets hit, the playbook come into place. I'll give you a very personal example for us. Um, you know, the second quarter of 2020, uh, Painas had that had until that time had literally a decade worth of continuous high growth. Then we had one quarter of negative 25% because during that period, everybody, all the customers said, you know, stop discretionary spending, stop external consulting. Uh, what was the signpost that says, if you just assumed you continue that trajectory, you would have gone down a different path. If that was a temporary thing and you'd come up in my industry, your decisions to increase capacity in advance, because it takes a long time, are all the choices and whether you'll gain share or not on an upturn. And so I like to think we said, well, we have a downturn playbook. The real issue in a signpost of a downturn playbook is how do you disproportionately capture the upturn after the downturn? And it's a little bit counterintuitive because you have to have the courage to build capacity during the downturn so that you can capture in the upturn. And part of the reason my company gained so much share in 2021 is we were the first ones who made the bet in the summer of 2020 that A, business demand would pick up and B, that we could figure out how to do consulting via Microsoft Teams and Zoom 
rather than meeting in person. And once that happened, the uh, you know we we got the benefits of the market share gain in the upturn. But but the conviction of what were the signposts to trigger that. And so maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll summarize um, what those questions, what those signposts might be for this current moment. You know, as we sit here in the middle of uh, 2022, um, for most companies, you can some of these will be more relevant than others. Um, how robust is customer demand? You expect? You can predict. You know, inflation's going up, interest rates going up, prices are going up. You think customer demand will increase or decline? And how? I, I see this in my own planning because our business is still so robust. It's easy to say, hey, we had that downturn hasn't hit yet. But you should be able to predict based on history. Um, how will inflation affect your business? Top line, cost, pricing. Do you have inflation skills? You know, do you have good price increasing skills in a thoughtful way? How are the recent shocks of, of impacting your ESG agenda? This is a question that, I, that in some parts of the world is actually number one. I think that's an interesting question where it's true here. So many companies, um, you know, I'm, I, we're part of a group of now 120 companies associated with the World Economic Forum that have committed to be net zero carbon by 2050 or earlier. In our case, 2030, you know, um, only eight years from now. And so it requires investment to get to that point. Will all these shocks change your ESG agenda? And we are seeing companies making this trade-off. We're supposed to um, wean ourselves from fossil fuel, but the technologies are not here yet. How do you make the transition? How might post-globalization present new opportunities and risk? For this country, what does post-globalization mean? We probably were not that connected, maybe, to Russia and Ukraine. We are absolutely connected to China and to the United States and to some of the region. So will that create new opportunities and new risks? We are seeing many of our European and American clients rebalance their investment portfolios, both corporate and financial investors, to have less exposure to China in this post-globalization world. Well, where will that investment differentially go? When I spend my time in Singapore, they're all saying, put it here. Um, same thing in Vietnam. Can they come here? Um, how are you assessing resilience? When you say resilience, can our strategy handle different scenarios? You know, what if COVID came back? What if we had a war, an invasion closer to home than, uh, than over in Europe? And finally, how do you evolve your own planning process to, to build this uh, all in? And I say, if you have good answers to these, uh, to these questions, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably better be able to handle the uncertainty of the, uh, the corridors and, and maybe the years to come. So maybe I'll start that with food for thought and then we can uh, get more specific in, in Q&A. Uh, Thank you for the initial uh, comments, I think. Now I will switch to a mic. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Manny, for that sobering discussion. So we're now headed um, to our Q&A with everyone, our on-site and online guests. So for our guests who are we, with us physically, there are mics stationed at the center of the room. Please approach it anytime so that you can ask your questions directly to Manny. And for our online guests, please type your questions at the chat box. My colleagues here, Gita and Bern, will make sure that your questions are asked. Please don't forget to introduce your name and company when asking these questions. So just to kick off, okay, let's wait. Okay, just to kick off the discussion, um, Manny. 
So um, thank you for emphasizing that companies must be resilient in just continuing um, uncertainty and volatility. We have different um, guests in the room coming from different industries. So I would just like to ask which industries face the most risk if they don't heed your warning about, you know, anticipating different, um, uh, if they don't anticipate properly the sustained turbulence that you warn us of? Uh, so th thank you. I, I would say that uh, you have to go from the general trends that I talked about earlier and the reason, to, and, and it's a good question, and you have to get very specific. And that's the way, you know, we do our planning. Um, the impact of all of these trends, industry by industry, in fact, sub-industry by sub-industry, you can take an industry like financial services. Well, banking, retail banking, corporate banking, wealth management, insurance will be very, very different. You have to look at each of those trends horizontally, and then you also have to... Um, connect the dots to the markets you play in, you know, which in our case is, is this a global issue? Is this a regional issue for Asia Pacific overall, or is it a national issue? And so you, you almost have to do planning at the level of this three-dimensional cell. You know, how will this trend hit insurance in the Philippines on sustainability, for example? You know, and, and so we, we'd say, uh, Every single industry, and you could walk through them, will have some of these things hit mo some of those cells more than others. And, and the importance, the, the way we would do planning, is to not spend your time on all the cells. You know, to say, what, what is it really out of all of that? If it's, um, you know, deglobalization hitting the supply chain of a manufacturing company on certain components, is that the core issue? If it's, you know, for, for a company like Bain, where our product is people, so you say my industry, professional services, a global professional services firm, how does this affect me? You know, well, I have to go literally to specific countries, um, and places where the great resignation affects us more than others. And so solving talent in the United States for my company is right now a priority. Um, solving it in another country might, might be different. So you could, you could look all that and it's, uh, uh, it's, it'll be too complicated to go through each. Obviously inflationary trends will affect some industries a lot compared to others, consumer products, retail, the digital transformation trends, which has been um, a tailwind for the uh, for the tech industry, you know, arguably will continue. The decarbonization trend, um, it's actually industry and region specific, which is going to be a challenge because it turns out some countries care about decarbonization more than others, and yet we all share the same global atmosphere and, uh, and, and the global ocean. So it's, it's going to have to be a custom answer uh, one by one. And so I, I, the advice I'd give for any of you, even though you're in different industries, take it to the sub piece, map it against the trends. You know, you'll probably have a complicated matrix of three by seven by, but there's probably four or five cells that really matter for your company get sharp on those. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So you mentioned several industries like financial. Uh, there's also, you mentioned manufacturing and tech. And I believe um, some of our guests here with us today are coming from those sectors. So if you want guidance on how to go specific with your planning, um, please feel free to approach um, the microphone. And I believe one's coming up. Uh... Can I use this one? Yeah, perfect. Hi, um, thank you very much, Manny. Um, my name is Roma. I'm a managing director for Jepson and Jessen Ingredients. We're a specialty ingredients distribution company. I have a question regarding China and what you were saying about China and how perhaps the, the rest, the Western world at least, was trying to pivot some of their supply chains away from China and how that represented an opportunity for 
for the region, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, China, Chinese competition or Chinese products coming into ASEAN for us has always been a very, um, a very serious uh, thing. Yeah, they've, they've always been here. We've, we've always fought um, um, against their products, sometimes working co collaboratively, but more, more often than not, in a, at, at least for my company, because we represent products from, from Europe, the US, the rest of the region as well. But, but these are mainly our competitors. Uh, do you think that as, as perhaps there will be more supply chains that will be region-based and not going through via China, it, does that translate into extra capacity in China or at least the desire from Chinese companies to maybe sell those products elsewhere and, and where else to sell them than uh, perhaps ASEAN, which is China's backyard, or I, I would think that this would be a, a very strong market for them. So what I'm asking in a very long-winded way, sorry, is do you think that China will become more of uh, uh, this this pivot will become uh, will intensify competition for my company or for my sector or do you think that there are other dynamics here or perhaps that the assumptions are wrong thank you thank you okay thank you Omar Omar right is that guy? Um, you know China is probably one of the major complicated questions for a lot of companies in a lot of industries. Um, and, um, and it's not just, obviously, it's not just in 2022. This has been happening for a long time. You, you, cannot, uh, you cannot ignore the fact, you know, Bain has a, a very large business in China, um, that it's, it's a big market, it's a big source of supply, it's a big source of customers. It's a big player in, in the world in so many different ways. So it's, it's a little bit too uh, glib and flip to say, oh, we'll just disconnect from China. Um, you, can't, you can't really do that. What, but what will happen for most companies, back to this issues of adaptability, resilience, prediction, you know, you can do a case study on what I talked about. Can you predict China scenarios? Um, I've been in boardrooms in the last two years that for the first time in my 30 years in business, people are actually putting scenario planning. You know, what if they cross the strait, the Formosa Strait? You know, will that, what, what will that change? Um, can, can you predict would they, even as early as two or three months ago, when Russia was invading Ukraine, you know, what's China's position going to be on Russia and their capacity? So partly is, you know, we don't necessarily know the answers, but to, to be able to at least understand and scenario plan what that means. You know, then I said, okay, let's be adaptive. Um, again, this varies industry by industry, you're in food components. I worked for a long time at one of the major tech companies because yeah, I used to do management consulting before I tried my hand at being a CEO of a management consulting company. And by the way, it turns out being a consultant has been easier than a CEO. I can, I can, I can acknowledge that. Call a few CEOs here. But as a management consultant for a tech company whose supply chain was really built on the back, and it's a global company, American headquarters, whose supply chain was built on the back of uh, real dependency on China, you know, which for good reasons, some of the world's best manufacturing capacity was there. Well, long before this year, once the President Trump started putting tariffs, um, they sort of uh, de uh, reduced the dependency on one country and built a very different supply chain config. And arguably, it's more costly then, but created more resiliency. Um, so, you know, I, I would say for the, um, the ASEAN companies where we know there is this big market here next to us, it's a big competitor, it's a big supplier. Um, at the same time, there's big chunks of the world <laughs> are also your customers and uh, potentially your suppliers. You have to get a very specific strategy uh, for it. And so, it, you know, it's hard for me to answer for your company uh, specifically. I, I will I will say and observe that China is going to continue to be, you know, a big 
market, a big player who's committed. A lot of companies in the West, um, especially in the advent of the decisions they made in general, um, on the, even on the basis of values to disconnect their, to disconnect from Russia, um, are anticipating, preparing, do we disconnect or at least reduce the dependency on China compared to before? And it's a tough question, by the way, for many. Um, the Russian economy collectively is about the size of Canada. You know, so all the companies, 600 and counting, according to Jeff Sonnenfeld of Yale, who said, I'm out of Russia, partly because of social issues, values. Um, you know, can you make the same decision on China if uh, push comes to shove? I'm not sure. Um, so it's, I can't give you a definitive answer, but I would absolutely tell you the China issue is a major strategic node in a lot of strategic planning conversations happening around the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Would you have any follow-up questions to that? We're good. For other guests here, would you like to ask some specific uh, scenarios and how it would impact your company? Okay. Maybe we can wait for... Or, or volunteer. Or volunteer. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, um, let me just have a quick follow-up because you were mentioning about scenario planning. But what about um, what? What's the implication of the current situation on term plannings? Because you mentioned that uh, businesses must go specific, um, taking into account all these developments into their businesses. But usually, businesses would also do like a medium-term, short-term plannings. With everything that's going on at a fast pace, um, what's the implication on that? So you know, one of the uh... One of the multi-year trends as well, and, and obviously business and sometimes management consultants are at fault. You have all these buzzwords. Um, one of the buzzwords the last few years was agility, you know, um, agile transformation, something we, we borrowed uh, arguably from the software development industry. So um, I will say that the, um, the planning horizons and the commitment to linear multi-year plans is absolutely getting reduced. You know, if you look at the strategic planning process of the old days, here's the five-year plan, here's the milestone, we make investments. And obviously, it's, it varies industry by industry because some industries, the capital involved will take multiple years before setting the returns. But uh, we're just seeing much more dynamic planning, you know, back to this issue of the signpost, you know, Bain itself, you know, we're, we're a professional services company. We used to do three-year plans, just like many of our clients do. Three-year plan, annual budget, you know, and then we're tracking how we're doing in the budget, then we're tracking how we're doing in the plan year one, year two, year three, then you have a new one. By the way, our rotation cycle for the CEO historically was six years. So generally, kind of like the Philippine CEO. So it's sort of a, almost an easy, and it's two, two three-year terms. Typically, it's almost it was an easy um, symmetry to the life cycle of the management team. Well, you know, we are on a much more continuous planning cycle now that uh, every quarter we assess where we are and the the, the direction of travel, the true north, the mission and purpose of the company, that you can set. But the adjustments you make um, along the way, you don't need to do that necessarily every three years or every five. You can make continuous adjustments. And, you know, one, one thing I, I'll, I'll assert, and if you can tell me, uh, actually, you know, COVID, we all learn how to move faster. You know, if you think of how what companies did in second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, 2020, when we suddenly had to adjust and adapt, and COVID was not in any of our plans when we were starting January 2020. You know, that, that that's a silver lining for me. We can we can adjust and 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 almost build that in. That's why I'm saying, let's not go back to the old normal. The normal is just, you know, more more adaptability. Right. Uh, thank you, Manny. I believe that we have. Oh, okay. I think there's a quick follow up to that. Um, so please go ahead. Go to the mic. 
It's there on the, for our other guests, it's on the, um, it's to your right. So, I'm Ed Zahagon from Pinma. So, I've no been for quite a while. But it's a more a personal question. So what made you decide to put Bain in, in the country? I'm sure you have gone through a lot of scenario planning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In fact, uh, Ed, the, uh, the original plan was we were going to open in early 2020 and sort of uh, COVID adjusted. Um, oh, I, I appreciate the question and not to make this uh, any kind of advertisement. Uh, we have been serving this country for 25 years. You know, Bain's actually been in market. And so for international firms, you know, for professional service firms, you know, banks, investment banks, advisors, accounting firms, um, the, the strategic decision to what we call plant the flag, open an office, be there permanently, versus serve it from an expat position. You know, because even if you had lots of Filipinos, and we do, you know, Trisha was in Hong Kong, uh, Gino here was in, was in the UK and Singapore. Um, if you say, well, we can serve that market, we just bring in a team from Singapore or Hong Kong. That's sort of how we operated for, for 25 years. And so just as a little microcosm of um, the meaningfulness of a, of a country market as, a, you know, as, as, as uh, exemplified by we should have permanent office with capacity on the ground. Um, two things have to happen at the same time in businesses like ours. Number one, that the actual demand exists for a continuous scale business in a country like the Philippines. And we've been seeing that the last few years. And because for companies like us, the demand is local companies who are scaled enough that need our services here local companies that are regionalizing and globalizing, and there are, that could benefit from us here. Um, multinationals that have put their headquarters in the region or where this country itself matters. You know, it's very easy for, for a multinational that we work with, you know, a public client Coca-Cola might say, well, Bain do a project for us in Brazil, Canada or China, big markets. When multinational say, well, you should do a big market for Philippines. It's an attractive market, you know, 110 plus million people. Um, and, then the, and, and then the investor community, because uh, one thing that's happened in the world, world dynamics is there's actually more private companies than public companies um, as the private equity and equity capital industry has grown. And, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, Bain is the preeminent consulting firm serving uh, the needs of uh, the, all the major global private equity investors. And they've been investing here in the CN broadly. So one part of the equation is that demand was here. The other is talent. And so this one I'll, I'll speak a little bit. You know, I see my friend Jean-Pierre Fellenbach was a long time head of our practice in the CN. We've always been able to disproportionately attract Filipinos. And guess what? All of you here. Filipino management talent is very good and they can work in the region and they can work in the UK and they can work in the United States. And so one of the issues always, and you know, I, I feel some guilt myself. Well, is the, is our top talent willing to work here versus Singapore or San Francisco? And when, when we got to critical mass of five senior people, a full team, a full pyramid underneath with 20 plus people who said, we're willing to locate and base ourselves in the Philippines. That was a good point in time. So, you know, this was, I joined a firm that had six offices in the world in the late eighties. It took only 30 years <laughs> to get office number 65 in Manila, but I'm quite excited about it because I feel that, um, we have, we can make a difference with Filipino companies. We can also have Filipino talent that we build here that can, uh, can operate everywhere in the world. So, and, and we're, we're hopefully happy to be members of MBC with you. So, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Actually, um, for our guests here, uh, please, uh, take this time to cook up some of your questions. I will now turn over to our on-site participants. Gita, I believe you have some questions for Mr. Maceda from our audience. Take it away. Yes, um, 
Ms. Merceda, we have a question actually from Jose El Quisha. He's um, asking us that the dollar seems to be extremely strong because of the FED's moves to continuously increase to continuously increasing interest rates. The peso has weakened because BSP has not increased its base rates as much. The weak peso will contribute to higher inflation. Would you suggest that BSP adopt a more aggressive stance to counter inflation? Recommendations for the government. Th th thank you, Tito Joe. <laughs> the, um, uh, the use of interest rates for the U.S. Fed is sort of a long, well-established playbook. The, uh, and and uh, historically, the, the Fed's objective, if they can, is soft landing. And, and so to the extent they don't have that many levers at their disposal, most of us who follow, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an advisor necessarily to central banks. Trisha, I don't know if you ever advised your, your, you know, your late uncle when, uh, when he had some of, some of those issues. But um, I would say we, would, we all predicted that, of course, the Fed would going to start rate, increasing rates. It's the historical norm and playbook in uh, at least in U.S. monetary policy. We can debate whether we expected three quarters of point all at once versus historically do a quarter at a time. And, and if you look at how rapidly inflation has been rising in the U.S., they kind of had to go big. Now we can debate the root causes for inflation. You know, six months ago, we were all saying um, in, in the U.S., I'm a member of the business roundtable there, so we we get constant updates from both uh, Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen. They were pretty optimistic, actually, six months ago, that inflation was a temporary spike because of supply chain um, constraints that were caused by COVID, and a temporary spike because of the great resignation and labor gaps, but that it was going to self-correct by second quarter 2022. Okay. Then Russia crossed into Ukraine. And so, and then China shut down again. And, and so, so it's look at that. Uh, really, it's, it's second quarter of 22 and China shut down again. So the Shanghai ports, what we thought the supply chains would get unstuck. So I do believe that the, uh, the U.S. Fed now believes inflation, that these forces that are creating inflation are kind of here for the foreseeable future. You know, we don't have a quick solve for Russian energy um, coming off some of the market. We don't have a quick solve for Ukrainian grain still stuck um, and the planting seasons perhaps. Um, so, you know, they they finally acted, and they acted in a in a big way. And obviously, when interest rates across countries um, get out of whack, then then uh, the exchange rates change. I mean, I'm, I, I I don't mean to uh, get get very basic. So so yeah. So right now, with the, those interest rates, you you can't have big differences in interest rates and not expect changes in the exchange rates. And then the question is, well, what are you solving for? Do you want to reduce inflation? Do you want to change the exchange rate? Um, that's a, you know, very long winded way of avoiding answering the question directly to the BSP of the Philippines. But, uh, you know, I, I, I would expect at some point, at some point you'd, you'd have to respond and optimize that. And I don't expect that this uh, last move of three quarter points will be the last one anytime soon. Right. Um, I think we have we might have another question from online. So we will turn over to Chris later after this question is asked. Go ahead, Gita. Yeah. Um, Ambassador Quisha says thank you uh, online. And then I, the next question online actually is from Elmer. Um, Elmer is asked, uh, sorry, his name is Elmer Lapena of Festec. 
he asks that you mentioned that the abundance of capital in the you mentioned the abundance of capital in the economy. Is this related to the historic 25% surge in money supply in the USA between 2020 to 2021 to stimulate the economy? What are your thoughts on this trend in other places, and how do you think this will play out in the future? Well, thanks. Uh, Elmer is a classmate from uh, high school in LaSalle Green Hills. So regards, Elmer. I haven't seen you in many years. Um, so I'd probably say uh, when I mentioned the, um, the capital superabundance, that's a slightly different issue from the, the specific capital abundance in the contra COVID um, uh, solves that both the US government and Europe in particular did. Uh, you know, the, the, the long-term capital um, superabundance issue is really decade-long level of growth before COVID and financial returns and, and then applied to different sources of capital, including private capital. Um, and so part of the issue that uh, if I look at one subsector of private capital, the private equity industry has been so robust is because you know, they have kept growing and growing, growing until a few months ago until the major correction in tech. And even then, and so you had all these funds with what we call dry powder that were continuing to look for investments. So multiples are up. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of why we felt that there's a lot of continued um, economic growth out there. If, if one of the underlying um, determinants of that is people looking to put capital to work to make investments, you know, and then you could have to take capital superabundance down to geographic or industry levels, give all this capital, give you an example. Many of our clients say we want to allocate some of our capital and powder to Asia, but we don't want to put it in China as much as before. So if you're Asia sans China, like the Seans, that's, that's uh, an opportunity. I think what, um, Elmer was referring to, uh, I, 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 I expect, well, at least my interpretation on the other issue of actually putting money as part of the solve for COVID, right? The, uh, um, the, uh, the acts that were passed by the U.S. Congress, which were very new for the U.S. This was common in places like France or others that, uh, you know, your job gets eliminated, you can still you can still have your benefits and you're still going to pay paid for six months. That was very new in the US um, that uh, the jobs disappeared in 2020. And then you had these big checks, well, hundred dollars, multi hundred dollar checks in some cases that would, would keep you going. That was probably one of the contributors to in fact, even um, uh, Secretary Yellen would say that was one of the contributors to the great resignation. Well, why will I go back to work when the government's writing a check for me for for a few months in time? That's pretty much passed, by the way. That's 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 all used in the attempts by uh, the Democratic administration to put another wave in. Um, are have not succeeded getting through a 50-50 Congress. It's arguably, it's 51-49 because Senator Manchin is really on the other side. Um, so I think those are two almost opposite issues. I'd say the, the fact that those incentives have rolled out, I personally think we're going to be on the other side of the great resignation soon. We're seeing it already. You know, once the economies are softening down the world, Europe is arguably in recession already. Um, people will need jobs. People will need paychecks. People will come back to work. Um, we're seeing something in our own firm say the flip side of the great resignation is the great boomerang because you know people go try something else grass is not greener on the other side want to come back um, in the meantime uh, even with the reduction in in equity markets and the multiples coming down especially tech companies um, there is still a lot of 
investment capital out there looking to put to work. And then, you know, and then the question on that side becomes a little bit more um, one of timing. If you saw what happened back in 2008, nine, or in the second quarter of 2020, you know, multiples have been going steadily like this for the last two years. Now they've gone this. And then at some point you ask yourself as an investor, especially if you're buying companies, like many of you do, you know, do I wait first? I, I'm feeling this myself, you know, Bain's acquired 18 companies in the last four years and that we, we explicitly embraced M and A as part of our own strategic agenda. Hmm. I wonder what the multiple will be <laughs> later on in the year compared to now. So sometimes, but the, the interest, the, when I, and uh, the, the powder out there to keep investing, I presume for all of you that are deciding how much do I invest? Because when I say this is a period of strategic uncertainty, the real question you're asking, okay, this strategic uncertainty, what do I invest in? How much do I invest? Do I buy a company now? At what price? You know, is the price going to be better in six months versus last year? Or frankly, if I don't get it, I regretted some companies I passed on in the summer of 2020. You know, said in hindsight, that but we pulled the trigger, you know, and, and that's where the the conviction that you have on making investments during a period of uncertainty that's what separates, you know, great investors and uh, you know, and those that just follow follow the crowd. Thank you, Manny, uh, Mr. De Pena, If uh... Manny interpreted your question right. Um, please do so. If you have a follow-up, please feel free to do so again. But now we're returning to our um, on-site guest. Chris, you have a question yeah, for Manny. Thanks, Jen. Hi, Chris Ilagan uh, Hi, from Chris. Cargill. Um, Hi, Chris. Yeah, and we've done some work with Bain. Thank, thank you, Cargill. <laughs> DMAC is a good friend. Oh, is it? great, great to hear. No, but, um, you know, I... I like how you talked about the whole scenario planning and improving your predictability. Um, when hindsight is 2020, right? Uh, of course, it becomes clear we should have seen COVID coming, the Russia-Ukraine crisis coming. I want to tap into your crystal ball. What are maybe a couple of quote-unquote black swan events in the grand scheme of things? It's not really a matter of if, but when that you may see on the horizon, either globally or actually, hopefully globally and maybe even regionally. Uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Wow, Chris, thank you. <laughs> Even if the probability is 80% happening, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Nothing's ever absolute. Well, uh, I'll tell you the, um, the big ones we scenario plan on the, um, you know, on the trends that we see, and maybe I'll call, I'll call three out. Um, uh, the deglobalization issue, I mentioned this earlier. Um, that's probably the big one we all scenario plan, right? China. A little bit Saudi Arabia, too, as the, one of the world's other largest sort of, large source of energy, especially since Russia. So am I willing to crystal ball uh, what would happen in China? I probably was willing to crystal ball pretty early that at some point they would abandon a zero COVID policy. And you and I can debate whether we think that's finally happening because you can argue if they hadn't stuck with that, you know, would things be, be better? You know, um, I don't expect them to invade Taiwan in our planning horizon. Some people do, you know, I don't. So it's like, you, you want me to take positions? So, you know, that's, but the whole point of the talk is to avoid crystal balling, right? So, um, but all of those have uh, the whole issue of China. Um, second is um, global, just global peace. That's a big one for me. Um, I can't tell you if, if I were in this room in Europe, and I have been multiple times in the last month, how the, the Europe, the, the Russia-Ukraine war just dominates everybody's mindset. You know, you, you, you thought 
the Germans had forgotten World War II and then it all came back. And so if I look at global stability um, and where that might happen, you know, um, obviously if you look at the implication, you know, you're, you're in the food industry uh, and in, in, your, in your supply. You know, if, if things really go south in Africa, will that affect the world? You know, maybe not, but if in, in other places. You know, and then I'd say the third that's kind of I'd, I'd like us to have a point of view is the decarbonization sustainability issue, really. Um, you know, we're, uh, because this is, for me, this is uh, not to get, melodramatic. This is survival of the species. This is survival of the planet. You know, are we really going to make enough changes to keep global warming below a certain number, you know, whether it's 1.5 or 2, and are we going to make those changes? And again, um, I don't sense that as much in my dialogues here as something that's at the very top of the priority list. But I'll tell you, I talk to a lot of CEOs and investors and say, out of everything else, that's the issue. Because, you know, we're not talking about is one country going to win or another? Is one industry going to win or another? It's literally, if we don't do this, you know, do our grandchildren or great-grandchildren still have a, a survivable planet to live on? And then if I say, can I crystal ball? Will the world actually get its act together to move in concert to address this? When it's clear the world is bifurcating to some countries that care about this and others that don't. And that's actually bad, right? Because then if the ones who care about it are incurring higher costs and higher pain and the ones that don't care about it are still polluting, so that one, uh, I don't, you know, that's where I deny my crystal ball instincts and I go to my hopefulness and optimism. It says, darn it, we'll figure out, we'll figure out how to solve this. And, and I do think that's important even for this country to, uh, to embrace. I, I know there's, there's, uh, there's movements and pressures here. And, you know, your, your company is, is, uh, very, very active in a, decarbonization, sustainability agenda. I just don't know if it's we're going to get it done in time. I was, you know, Glasgow COP26, which I attended, I had mixed feelings <laughs> on the success. But you did mention about hope, hopefulness. Yeah. So certainly that's something that we will do. Um, I would like to go back to one of the themes that you mentioned several times, actually, during the Q&A, and that is about workers, um, great resignation, so in the Philippines, there's like a big debate around the topic. Um, uh, rising transport prices and even traffic are some of the reasons why workers would want to prefer the more flexible route. Can you share with us your observation um, about the global trends and companies in abroad? And for the companies um, here in the Philippines who have not made up their minds about that arrangement, what would be your advice? Okay, th so here's... Uh, there's a few interrelated topics. Um, part of your question is what is the work model of the future going to be? You know, like I said, my first meeting, we were all in person. My next one, we were all in Teams or Zoom. Now we're hybrid. Right? And so, uh, and, and how is that related to how you framed it, uh, the great resignation? Because it's one of the many factors that actually have contributed. Uh, when people are choosing to leave their companies and do something else. Some of them are choosing to say, I'm leaving because I don't want to work at all. Some would say, well, I'm leaving because I only want to work in a certain model. And if I only want to work at home, remote, and my company doesn't want me to do that, it's another um, reason to live. Or second order implication, some people are saying, well, at least we're rationalizing. If you didn't build culture and loyalty and identity with the company, because you weren't coming to the office and you weren't building relationships with peers and bosses and mentors and the mission of the company as effectively if you were remote. Um, 
were all those contributors to great resignation factors? Yes. You know, plus, plus Elmer's comment on, well, you know, you're paid not to work <laughs> in some countries. And then some, it's like, you know, people, people in COVID got, uh, um, you know, the you only live once mentality. Well, if it's going to get bad, I should do something that's meaningful and fulfilling. Um, so you, you, you put all that aside or you put all that together and say, are those contributing and will those, uh, to this historic great resignation, which I actually believe is on the downswing already. Um, it's probably later here because you haven't experienced it as much as, you know, where the U.S. was nine months ago versus where the U.S. is now. Now, the, the first part of the question is, what's the model actually going to be like? And, you know, I actually think it's going to be quite um, segmented. I don't think it'll be the same answer for everybody. And it's going to, it's going to vary by job type. We all know from the beginning, I mean, this office knows that there were always jobs you could do kind of remotely, you know, arguably a call center operation, even though you were in a physical space here serving customers in Australia, the U S was semi remote. Um, it's going to vary country by country, city by city, and it's going to vary a little bit by demographic, psychographic. So uh, what, what the answer is, it's at the extreme. We, we, we know and see companies that are fully embracing, let's do everything virtual. And we know and see companies that are saying, let's get everybody back into the office. And we're you no know, companies are embracing that you're going to be fully flexible at your discretion as individual. And we know companies that are more like us that says, you know, we want the team of people physically together for some part of the time. In our case, we try to target two and a half to three days because what we're all trying to solve for, um, and the, the answer to that equation is not the same for everybody, get the benefits of the virtual remote work, which we all experience. It's nice not to have to sit in traffic to go into the office, go there and come home. Right? Um, and it's nice, by the way, with the ESG agenda, not to fly or use your car, especially when gasoline is expensive. All the benefit, and it's nice to be able to, as a management consultant, I want the best expert in the world to join the meeting. You know, in the old days, you have to get them from some country, fly get here, introduce, so inefficient. Now it's like, oh, the best expert on insurance on this topic is our partner in Zurich. We invite you to the Zoom, tapos, right? Get, how do you keep all those benefits? But also on the other side, get the benefits that you are doing in person is the only way to do it. Build relationships, have some fun. Mm. You know, we are a social species, homo sapiens. We were not meant to be um, living individually, um, get mentors, have creative sparks. So I, I think, it'll, I think on average, it'll be less than before. And then if we get this right, I think you'll, you'll be able to adjust and get past this great resignation dynamics because everyone will find the model that fits the company, the best and the individual. And I'll tell you for my company, where our product, our product, one hundred percent is our people. We're not a factory. We're not a software company. You engage Bain. You're engaging a set of individual human beings with the full power of the firm behind them. We have to get this right for us to uh, succeed as a firm. So, for you, I think one of the first questions is, what are the top priorities, industry by industry? For my industry, this is number one. Yeah, thank you, Manny. Actually, you emphasizing that relationship with your workers is one of the key key goals for the company. It's something that would be important also for our guest today. So we now have a, we now have room for like a last few questions, but I believe there are still questions from our online guests. So take it away, Gita. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll make one comment, even if the question is not asked in a bit. All right. Uh, well, 
um, Mr. Lepata says thank you. And before I proceed to the next question, which is um, from Jed Belen from Belen Management Consulting OPC. And they ask, will resilience be a panacea for the world's woes or something else? You know, big question. I don't know that there's any panacea for the world's woes. You know, it's, uh, there was something uh, a couple of years ago that kind of was, was called the Moderna shot. But uh, is there, uh, is there, so I'd say, um, and even the term resilience, you know, what is it? It's, it's, it's kind of a, a noun that describes a state of a company that says we can handle stuff, right? That we'll, we'll be strong, we'll bounce back. Um, so it's not exactly a panacea. It's a way of coping, <laughs> I'd say, with the, with the world's woes. And, uh, and if part of the message not to be too doom and gloom is that the woes will keep happening. Right. This is just the nature of uh, what we're in. There will continue to be challenges. And so um, accepting that and building into it and not being too down, because at the end of month, there's another problem. You know, I'd, I'd say that's, uh, that, that, that's how I think about it. But no, I don't think it's a panacea. Um, you know, the, the comment that I'd meant to make came up um, uh, came up in our breakfast this morning uh, with Victor, which is the role of organizations like uh, the Makati Business Club. Um, because one of the realities, since if you look at so many of the factors we talked about, you know, globalization, ESG, um, technology, great resignation, it's very hard for an individual company to solve this on their own. It's very hard for an industry, although we see great things when the industries get together. You know, I was in Japan a couple of years ago in the early days of uh, b before ESG, and one of the things that impressed me, we work with some of the Japanese beer companies. You know, you know, they all agreed to have the same bottle. I said, why is that a good thing? The industry association, you know, whether you're Kirin, Sapporo, Asahi, it's the same bottle. It's so much more sustainable. It's so much more recyclable. You know, your brand differentiation. And, and I know, given some of the products I consume, that the size of a Johnny Walker Red versus Johnny Walker Black versus Johnny Walker Gold versus Johnny Walker Blue are different sizes. Para madali makita sa behind ng bar, which one it is. You know, but that's an example of an industry-wide phenomenon that when the industry agreed, we'll all use the same bottle. And competitors compete on branding and advertising. That's just a much more sustainable model. But it's not enough that companies work by themselves. It's not enough that they work in, in peers in, with other companies, including competitors. You got to work with the government. You have to work with the government. And, um, and so, you know, and that's kind of hard because governments sometimes have different motivations than businesses. We hope we're aligned. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, one organization I'm a part of in the U.S. called the Business Roundtable. It's the largest 200 companies in the U.S. Our explicit agenda, kind of a lobbying organization, is to influence government policy to make it easier for businesses to succeed, specifically American companies, in a bipartisan way which means an ongoing relationship with whichever president in power, with the key departments, in that case with the key senators, because no legislation gets passed unless you get a majority. And so one, uh, you know, one comment I make, one of the reasons I was excited to talk to you and even you know, honored to be invited to be part of the MBC is this is the kind of group um, this might be a closer answer to the panacea question, <laughs> you know, that if uh, while we're talking about um, resilient, adaptive, strategic planning as companies, if companies band together to solve some of this, we'll have a better shot. And if companies collectively influence government policy and regulation for business, which I hope uh, MBC does, uh, I do think those are important. Those are important moves. Mm -hmm. Thank you from uh, Jed Online. and. Turning over to JBG. 
just a follow-up question comment on that thank you for we discussed that earlier there are a lot of questions for you but i i do think that you know you, you uh spoke about we discussed today capital being able to attract capital that is seeking ex china asia uh, uh supply chain hedging uh vis-a-vis -vis china again which speaks to industrial policy maybe uh, uh uh, this uh, decarbonization, which is a collective effort, um, and you know, this morning we discussed agriculture and uh, food security. Um, yes, all of these I think uh, really require. In the end, you get back to government to create the enabling environment, um, and I, I guess uh, the the Japanese beer one was quite interesting, um, and I think there the point was also they could probably have decided among themselves but they wanted a neutral partner and and i'm thinking whether this might be actually a model uh where you know, the makati business club might not be considered the most neutral of organizations uh depending on the administration um but we do have a long history of working with government and with foreign governments, uh, a lot of the uh, initiatives um, from various embassies uh, gets channeled through COCO and his team. You know? So we have that network. And I do think uh, you know, your example from the business round table was, was quite apt. Um, and yeah, just, just as, a, as a little uh, advertisement, we do have committees um, that have been formed. There's, uh, digital and, and, and uh, governance, women in business. But if you feel the need for specific uh, issues that MBC could help address um, by working with government and perhaps with third parties, uh, neutral third parties, uh, um, advising, um, please you know feel free to. We, we we there was some discussion at the board meeting about perhaps getting involved in agricultural policy, maybe. Uh, so anyway, any, any thoughts on that? Further thoughts? No, th thanks. Uh, thanks, Victor. I, I do think that, um, you know, associations uh, can, be, can proliferate, obviously, there's, uh, and, and the Japanese example is basically the, the industry association of the beer industry. Um, so, you know, the, there are Intra, just the industry associations, I presume those exist here too. Um, there's chambers of commerce that usually operate, but that's very country specific. So again, and I know there's a US Chamber of Commerce, there's probably a UK Chamber of Commerce. So, but for um, an independent organization to be, or play, there's a lot of issues that are cross industry, I think as you experience. And, for most of the industries here, uh, influencing uh, the government in a good way, in a positive way, probably will help the industry. So I'm, I'm, I would say I'm a big fan and advocate for that. Um, you know, the BRT explicitly in all of their conversations is they're bipartisan. Right? So um, the Philippines doesn't necessarily have a history of it being a, a two-party system. So I'm not even sure who the different parties are. But almost nonpartisan might be the might be uh, the right way, and I I personally would be a believer that you know the right organization. And from what little I can tell, I'm not an expert in 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 the local market in any way. This is probably you know one of the best ones. It's cross industry. It has the right major players. You have international companies here too, um, and so how you mobilize and organize to influence. The government here, you know, I think it's a good question. Uh, uh, in in the U.S., you do it by committee to affect uh, the major pieces of legislation that either flow through, uh, in the end, that will flow through cabinet departments to implement, but have to flow through the legislature to get passed. And so it's almost a two-step coverage. And I would guess, I would guess it wouldn't be that hard here to say what is the right committee structure anyway, if you wanted to, if you wanted to go down that path. Um, so I, I would, I would be a, 
yeah. supporter of the concept, uh, yeah. Victor, and I've seen it work well, um, in, at least in the U.S. context. Actually, you're mentioning working with associations and the government. Geneve, your our co-host, is actually in charge of that from Makati Business Club. Perhaps you'd like to speak a little bit about the work you're doing. Oh, about the work that we're doing. So right now, actually, uh, Mr. Maceda and the rest of the membership here, we've been trying to approach the newly elected or the newly nominated um, heads of uh, key agencies, the economic ones. So we've met with the economic National Economic Development Agency nominated um, Secretary um, Arsenio Balisacan. We've also tried. Uh, we've also met um, the incoming Finance Secretary, Mr. Jokna, and um, relate some of the recommendations from the private sector. And we would also expect a um, meeting with the infrastructure and the transport secretaries in the coming months. So hopefully we would like to engage with the members um, in the coming days uh, to get your inputs on some of these upcoming meetings. So actually, um, well, thank you everyone to our discussion. I understand that some, um, there's, there, there's still pending questions, I think, in the chat. So if it's all right, Manny, maybe we can compile some of these questions later on, and maybe that's something that we can um, uh, answer, uh, send the answers to our audience um, after this event. But for now, because um, we promised 11.30, so first off, for all our guests, both online um, and on site, we would like to invite your, we would like to get your comments and feedback on today's event. So for our guests here, you will see the QR code on your table. So please scan them to answer the feedback form. And for those who are online, um, there will be a QR code flash on your screen. And there will also be a link um, that's going to be put in the chat box. But before we conclude, I would let just I would like to ask your short answer to this question because we're talking about the government. What can you tell our president? Is there anything that you can tell our incoming president right now? Wow. <laughs> you want the short answer? You know, um, I'd say it's uh, it's a uh, it's both a, a privilege and a responsibility. Uh, I like to say the best leadership is servant leadership. And so this is such a great moment in time, you know, with uh, with a mandate that uh, we haven't seen in many elections with this period of global and local uncertainty. And so I, I would just, uh, frankly, I'd, I'd wish him well, wish him the best and, and encourage him to, you know, pick and build a great team and, uh, craft if you want to adapt um, some of this stuff we're talking about you know what are we really going to stand for as a country what's the mission and purpose and what are the major strategic priorities to uh, to achieve that and and stay adaptive and resilient in the uh, in the years to come and um, wish uh, wish him the very best all right so i believe our board members would Talk, up, talk with you about the other things you would also mention to our president. But for now, um, we would like to invite everyone to a group photo. We will start first with our um, online guests. So um, if you can open your cameras and flash your smiles. So are we ready, um, Tessa? Okay. So for our online guests, um, this is your cue. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. And last, one, two, three, smile. Okay. Thank you. And for our attendees in the room, uh, you may stay on your seats. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, are we all set? Are you all ready? Yeah. Okay. So you're for talk first. All right. One, two, three, smile. One, two, three, smile. And lastly, one, two, three, smile. All right. So with that, once again, thank you, Manny. And thank you to our secondary sponsors, Huawei and Health Now, Media Partners, ANC, and Business World. Thank you to all members and guests for attending today's session. We appreciate your presence today. We hope to see you again in our next XO session featuring Dennis Anthony Uy of Converge ICT on July 28th. If you haven't registered yet, please visit our website, nbc.com.ph and our bulletins. Please also like our social media pages, which is flashed on your screen. Good day to all, and we look forward to seeing you again in our future events. Thank you and stay safe.